This week on Jerusalem Dateline, a high-level Syrian-Iranian meeting could mean a coming showdown between Israel, the U.S., and Iran. Plus, the prophetic significance of Israel's second largest city, Tel Aviv. And a look at how one Iraqi Christian town is rebuilding after the ravages of ISIS. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell, coming to you this week from the heart of Tel Aviv on Rothschild Boulevard. We'll talk more about Tel Aviv later in the program. But first, Iran's defense minister paid a high-level visit to Syria. It's a sign of strengthening ties between the two countries that poses a threat not only to Israel, but to U.S. interests in the Middle East. Iran's defense minister, Amir Hatami, led a high-level delegation to Syria that signed new military and defense agreements with the Assad regime. It's a signal Iran wants to maintain and even increase its military capabilities inside Syria. Yet Israel sees Iran's military presence inside Syria and on its northern border as a direct threat. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has stated repeatedly Iran's military presence inside Syria is a red line Israel won't tolerate. It's also a priority for the Trump administration. This is a uh, very delicate, very difficult situation in Syria, uh, but one that we're not going to allow uh, the Iranians to take advantage of. The United States has been pressuring Iran to pull out its fighters from Syria, and U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton addressed the issue with reporters during his recent visit to Jerusalem. That Iran obviously had a strategic plan to create uh, an arc of control from Iran through the Shia areas of Iraq into Syria, linking up with Hezbollah in Lebanon. That's not something that we want to see. Bolton also defended Israel's recent attacks against Iran forces inside Syria. Every time Iran has brought missiles or other threatening weapons uh, into Syria in recent months, uh, Israel has struck those targets. Uh, I think that's a legitimate act of self-defense on the part of Israel. Iran's defense minister said his country's presence inside Syria won't be dictated by a third party and that they would continue to support the Assad regime. Iran has provided thousands of fighters in Assad's fight for survival against rebel forces. Their continued presence inside Syria sets up a showdown with Israel and the U.S. as the more than seven-year civil war is coming to an end. Not only is the end of the Syrian civil war in sight, but the caliphate of ISIS has been defeated in Syria and Iraq. Despite the end of the Syrian civil war and the defeat of ISIS, there's massive reconstruction needed in both Middle East countries. CBN's George Thomas spoke with one group that's rebuilding a Christian town in northern Iraq. Nearly half the country's population is displaced. Millions have fled the fighting. Before the war in 2011, some 1.7 million Syrians, about 10% of the population, were Christian. Some say that number has now dropped by as much as 70%. It's a similar picture, by the way, in neighboring Iraq, where ISIS's campaign of genocide against Christians has decimated their numbers. Now, one group is helping Christians in Iraq and Syria rebuild their lives. Since 2014, Knights of Columbus, the largest Catholic fraternal organization in the world, has committed more than $20 million to help persecuted believers in the Middle East. Joining me to discuss the group's work is Andrew Walther, Vice President of Communications for Knights of Columbus. Uh, Andrew, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, tell us about your efforts uh, to rebuild the Iraqi Christian town of uh, Karamles. Well, thank you very much. It's good to be here. You know, last year we announced an initiative where we would begin working to build or rebuild one of these Christian towns that had been so decimated by ISIS. And that town is the town of Karamles, which is uh, near Karakosh, not too far from Mosul, between Mosul and Erbil in northern Iraq. And this was a town that had had hundreds of families, all of whom had been forcibly displaced by ISIS. And when the town was liberated, it was in a terrible state. It, there were you know, unexploded uh, bombs, there were booby traps, it was, many of the homes were burned or had, you know, uh, battle damage. And the 
the level of devastation was really shocking. So the Knights of Columbus were able to put about $2 million into that project. We committed $2 million to move hundreds of families back home to help them repair their their homes and really get on with their lives, pick up the pieces and and to help preserve the multicultural pluralism that has existed in, in Iraq, the Christian communities that have existed in Iraq for well over a thousand years. Uh, you've also provided food and conducted the medical outreaches, right? Yes, yeah, so the Knights of Columbus have worked uh, throughout northern Iraq since 2014. We've, we've got medical clinics that assist the needs of the Yazidi and Christian and, and uh, Muslim populations there. We have uh, housing that we've helped to build for uh, some of the displaced communities. We have also a substantial amount of money that we've put into food aid for the Christian community there and others in their care. Many times uh, individuals from the Yazidi community and other communities will be dependent also on the Christian community for the food and shelter that they have. And so we've really uh, done about $20 million of work there since 2014. Uh, remind us again, Andrew, what ISIS did to many of Iraq's Christian uh, towns and villages. Well, when ISIS swept through northern Iraq and, and similarly in Syria, they decimated the Christian population. They gave people the option to convert die or in some cases flee. Many times people fled just ahead of ISIS. Um, there were, I'm told by the church leaders in Syria, thousands killed there, hundreds killed in Iraq. They were able, in large part in Iraq, to escape to Kurdistan, to the city of Erbil, some also to Dohuk up in the north. And in, in moving out, these areas became totally controlled by ISIS as the Christians and the Yazidis were forced out of out of their towns and villages and, and into neighboring Kurdistan where they had a, a level of safety there. And so as these things began to be liberated, as these lands began to be liberated by the Iraqi forces and so on, over the last year, year and a half, uh, it's been very important to help these original populations move back and to maintain the kind of pluralistic environment that existed there in Nineveh, in northern Iraq, uh, for, as I said, I mean, in, in the case of, of Mosul, I mean, you're going back almost 2,000 years. Yeah, okay. Mr. Andrew Walzer of uh, Knights of Columbus, sir, thank you for your insights, and I hope you will come back on the show again. Thank you very much. Coming up, CBN Scott Ross takes a look at the growth and prophetic significance of Israel's second largest city, Tel Aviv. President Trump has moved the U.S. Embassy from here in Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. While the ancient city is the center of biblical events, Tel Aviv has become Israel's high-tech and economic center. It's also the place where you can get good espresso. Thanks, Ronan. Okay. And as Scott Ross found out, the bustling city is also fulfills biblical prophecy. Situated on the shores of the Mediterranean, Tel Aviv could be described as Israel's New York City. And in just over 100 years, it's become one of the world's leading startup cities. Tel Aviv was established in 1909. It is a very young city. It, it is. All this was sent here in 1909. What was the vision for it? And the vision was to establish here a modern Jewish city that speaks the Hebrew language, a foundation for a Jewish life. The idea was to realize the dreams, the hopes, the prophecies of our prophets and the dreams of the Jews all over the world. The most amazing thing about the Jewish people is the fact that we keep dreaming the same dream wherever we are through the centuries. Next year in Jerusalem, next year in Jerusalem. Who were the leaders, the people that founded Tel Aviv? 66 Jewish families. Uh, the inhabitants of the old city of Jaffa. Narrow alleyways, you know, sewage in the street, and an oriental uh, city struggling. Jews in Jaffa dream about leaving, breaking from the walls of Jaffa and establish here a Jewish neighborhood. We paid in gold for every inch here. And the money was paid to whom? To the Ottomans? Who are the Ottomans? That's not their land. This was redeeming the land of Israel. Isaac Dror is the education manager of Independence Hall, 
the location where David Ben-Gurion declared Israel's statehood and its founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence. We're seated here in front of Independence Hall. This is a significant place. It is significant. It is really significant. It is the place where Israel was born, but it is also the place where Tel Aviv was established. It was the home of the founder of Tel Aviv. It was the first art museum of the city. In the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel lived in a place called Tel Aviv, a Jewish city in Babylon where he was prophet, a tiny Jewish community in the desert of Iraq, exiled Jews. In 1950, Tel Aviv and Jaffa merged to form Tel Aviv Yafo. It's also where Jonah caught a ship to flee from the Lord and ended up in the belly of a whale. Today, it's Israel's second largest city, and though it's home to all foreign embassies, Tel Aviv is clearly not the biblical capital of Israel and the Jewish people. This city, in contrast to Jerusalem, Jerusalem is a more of a religious environment. This city does not have to bear the heavy load that Jerusalem is carrying. It is the holiness of Jerusalem. And Tel Aviv does not have to carry all this history. But Tel Aviv is very, very special in a different way. Israel's founders sensed they were fulfilling prophecy. In the middle of this secular city, surrounded by construction cranes, one monument says it all. This is from the Bible, Jeremiah, and it says here, I shall rebuild you and you will be built, O Virgin of Israel. This is the motto of those who established Tel Aviv. And as we stand here now, the prophecy is being fulfilled yes, in front of your eyes. in front of your eyes. It is the first time after 2,000 years, the Jewish people building the Jewish land, speaking Hebrew with their Bible in their hand, in the land of Israel. Today, Tel Aviv is known as Silicon Wadi. What is it about Tel Aviv that so much creativity, innovativeness has come out of this area? There's more than 700 startup companies concentrated in this city. There's venture capital that is being invested in Israel, which is the highest per capita in the world. Combined, of course, with Israel's uh, culture and with Israel's uh, circumstances, have made Tel Aviv what it is today, the second uh, Silicon Valley of the world. I asked Ben Shahar about the future of Tel Aviv. It is going to explode. The amount of high-tech companies, the amount of innovations that are developed here that are crucial to making the world a better place are going to come out of Tel Aviv. And more research and more funding is going to come into this uh, city and hopefully create a better future, not just for Jews, but for Christians, Muslims, Buddhists uh, around the world. For CBN News, I'm Scott Ross in Tel Aviv. Up next, a look at Israel through the eyes of one of America's top entertainers and her new book, The Rock, The Road, and The Rabbi. Welcome back to Jerusalem Dateline. Here's the scripture from the prophet Jeremiah that Scott Ross talked about in his story on Tel Aviv. Another person passionate about Tel Aviv and all of Israel is American entertainer Kathy Lee Gifford. She talked with CBN's Ephraim Graham about her many visits to the Holy Land, her Christian faith, and her new book called The Rock, The Road, and The Rabbi. When I closed my eyes and held my very breath and let you love me to death. From the recording studio. That remains yeah. to be seen. I'm going to sing it later in the show. But to the television studio. We went, we went Kathy Lee still. Gifford yeah, is an all around and, entertainer and, with and, uh, unmatched yeah, passion. Follow your joy, and it will lead to God's purpose for your life. And I have a mantra, which is, my joy is non-negotiable. <laughs> at the same time, the fierce army of the Philistines had been camped at the Valley of Ella for 40 days. Gifford is a gifted performer who is also passionate about her faith. You can see it in the pages of her latest bestseller, The Rock, The Road, and The Rabbi. What inspired you to want to tackle 
this. You've written best-selling books already. What inspired this? I've been going to Israel. I've been going to the Holy Land since I was 17 years old. I was a big Bible nerd from, from the time I became a Christian when I was 12 years old. <laughs> and uh, this was back in the 70s. And it was the first Jerusalem conference on biblical prophecy. Mm. And my father, as my, as my graduation gift from high school, get, got tickets for my mom and me to go to um, Israel and attend that. Mm. And I was thrilled. I mean, I missed my high school graduation. I could have cared less. I could have missed high school. I could have <laughs> wow. cared less. I always was anxious to get to the Holy Land and be where everything happened mm. and just um, soak it in. These are snapshots from one of her trips to the Holy Land with Rabbi Jason Sobel, who helped her to write the book. In 2012, my husband and I went on our, our first, what we call a rabbinical trip. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's when everything changed for me. And when I started really studying the way the Messianic rabbis mm -hmm. teach, mm -hmm. because the, the Word of God was written by Middle Easterners for Middle Easterners. Yeah. And when we try to apply our Western mindset or mm -hmm. traditions or, or thought process or, uh, towards that, it never works. Mm -hmm. we, we, we have to go back to who they were yeah. and what was happening at the time that it happened. And we have to understand what the languages truly meant. Most people think that Jesus was a carpenter. Well, not according to the, the Greek in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. The word for what Jesus and Joseph did was tekton, T-E-K-T-O-N. Yeah. And that means either builder or it means architect. Well, Jesus was the architect of all of creation, so that would make sense. And if I'm going to base my entire life on something, mm -hmm. I have to know what it really means. Many people call themselves Christians. They've never even read the Bible, much less know what it says. Kathy Lee aims to make the pages of the Bible come to life and encourage people to read it more. If you know Israel, there's like a three-mile circumference around the temple. Everything is about worship at the temple. Everything was about the spilling of blood for the atoning of sins in the temple. Those shepherds were Levitical priests, yeah. shepherds. Mm -hmm. And those, those, um, those lambs were born for the same reason that Jesus was in Bethlehem, right there, to be sacrificed for the oh sins <laughs> of, of the people. Mm -hmm. And what did they do? What did they do to the lambs as soon as, they, as soon as they were born? They wrapped them in swaddling clothes and laid them in mangers. This is, a, this is the kind of journey we go on in the Rock, the Road, and the Rabbi. It is so and I hope it ignites people's faith. We are so lukewarm. Uh, so lukewarm in our society today. Our battery is like on, I think on like, you know, critical mass or something. And because we're not understanding what the word of God really says, mm -hmm. therefore we're not applying it properly to our, in our own daily lives. Absolutely. And we're living half of our faith out because we're not living our Jewish part. Yeah. And I think you say it really profoundly when you're talking about how it came alive for your husband. Yes. Religion versus yes. relationship. I don't want religion in my life. I don't want religion. I want relationship with the living God. Is there a favorite place for mm. you to visit since you've been so many times? If you were going and could go to one place, mm. what would you say go? Oh, it, that's an impossible question mm. to answer. I um, adore En Gedi because so much of our life is, um, is in desert. So much of our life does involve suffering. Mm -hmm. And David suffered so, uh, think about it, as a, as a young man, probably 12 to 14 years old, he was anointed by, by uh, Samuel to be king. Yeah. When did he actually become king? When he was 30. 30. <laughs> 30. That's a long time to wait on God yeah. and half the time to be separated from his loved ones and his family and hiding in caves from King Saul who wanted to kill him. Here is also a reminder of God's provision an oasis in the desert for all who believe. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, New York. Up next, a new movie chronicles the Mossad's daring capture, one of Nazi Germany's most notorious war criminals. Years ago, I interviewed a man named Peter Malkin. Malkin had just written a book called Eichmann in My Hands. Adolf Eichmann was one of Hitler's chief executioners during the Holocaust. And Malkin actually seized Eichmann on a street in Buenos Aires, Argentina in May of 1960. He was part of a daring Mossad raid to capture Eichmann and bring him back here to Israel for trial for his crimes against humanity. Now a new movie portrays the capture of Eichmann and the dramatic relationship between the Nazi executioner 
and Malkin, who lost family during the Holocaust. Take a look. We have our guy, Adolf Eichmann. Let's go. This is a country full of ex-Nazis. They're all over the city. Start the engine. Adolf Eichmann was less famous uh, than Hitler, but equally lethal and horrific a figure in the Holocaust. I'm offering you a fair trial. You want me to stand trial in place of an entire regime? Eichmann used to say I was a small cog in the machine, but actually he was the machine. He was a very ambitious, manipulative person, and the extent of his crimes are not covered just by someone who followed orders. What compels me to play Adolf Eichmann is the true story of the capturing of a monster and honoring all that monster's victims. Eichmann, the architect of the Holocaust, has been found. A call comes into the Mossad that he is in Argentina. A group is assembled to go to Buenos Aires. I played Peter Malkin, who wrote a book called Eichmann in My Hands. If it is him, we need an elite crew. I'm not joining your hit squad. I play Rafi Eitan, who is a Mossad agent and organized team of people who went to extract Eichmann. Policia! Hide him, quickly. The search for him, the hunt for him, the terrible risks involved. We have to warn the others. Let's go. All of this is absolutely thrilling. Do you recognize the man in this picture? I can't see him clearly. The man in this picture is you. SS number 45381. 45381. 45381. 45381 was 45326. Enough, I accept my fate. My name is Adolf Eichmann. Well, it looks like a powerful movie, and now a thriving Tel Aviv and Israel are a testament to how Eichmann and Hitler fail to eradicate God's chosen people, as many have failed to do so throughout history. And it's a reminder to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the Jewish people who are still surrounded by enemies who want to destroy them. Well, that's all for this edition. Thanks for joining us here on Rothschild Boulevard in Tel Aviv. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.